Yes, it does. Okay. Welcome everybody to our third training uh, entitled Building Your Climate Action Toolkit. Uh, this training is uh, entitled How to Advocate and Campaign. I am Peter Sloan, our campaign coordinator, and I will be leading you in this training today. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my, uh, my slideshow. Okay, so how to advocate and campaign. Uh, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, wherever you're Zooming from, if you're in the San Diego region, uh, we are all occupying the unceded ancestral lands of the Kumeyaay people, the original native inhabitants of San Diego County. And the Kumeyaay have lived in this region for more than 10,000 years and their lands once extended from the Pacific Ocean south to Ensenada, east to the sand dunes of the Colorado River, and north to Warner Springs Valley. Today, we pay respect to the Kumeyaay elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Okay. Uh, everything in this training is going to be information that I have drawn from these three amazing texts, which uh, you can see here, and I will share the slides afterwards with everyone, so you can follow the links. But Organizing Cools the Planet by Hillary Moore and Joshua Kahn Russell uh, is an outstanding pamphlet that gives you a lot of um, tools and techniques to, uh, to be a community organizer with a focus on climate. Uh, Beautiful Trouble, a toolbox for revolution is a text and website uh, by the activist group, The Yes Men. Uh, the main editor is Andrew Boyd, who is one of the members of The Yes Men. And uh, it's just an amazing resource with a lot of case studies, principles, examples, um, recordings, news clips, um, a, a lot of just sort of inspiring and educational content uh, from groups who have done activist work like Direct Actions, um, sit-ins, uh, creative, nonviolent, direct action, a lot of stuff. So Beautiful Trouble, I recommend very highly. And then Hope in the Dark is a wonderful uh, book by the writer Rebecca Solnit. Um, it's kind of a recent history of the, the untold history of the American left, sort of from the 90s um, up through the 2000s. She wrote it um, in the early 2000s, and then there was an updated edition uh, a few years ago. And it's very inspirational if you're ever if you're ever just feeling a little hopeless, if you feel like the world is on, on the wrong track and you are doubting your agency and your empowerment to really make a difference, I recommend you pick up a copy of Hope in the Dark because it will um, it, it'll light a fire under you and it'll show you that uh, that people have made a difference and we can make a difference. And uh, it was a very inspirational book for me, so I, I recommend it. All right, our objective today is to understand and apply the following core concepts in strategic campaigning. We're gonna talk about centering justice. We're gonna talk about finding our front line. We're gonna talk about aligning our front lines and, uh, and coalition building. We're gonna talk about a social analysis, uh, having a theory of change. We're gonna be doing some power mapping and talking about the spectrum of allies and opposition. We are going to be talking about picking our target, our tactics, and our timeline. And we will be looking at issues involving campaign narrative, um, some methods for how to debrief, assess, and evaluate our campaign, uh, how to continue our campaign, how to escalate it, how to pivot it. And uh, if we have time, we will get to some uh, creative case studies and principles uh, that are from that beautiful trouble book that I mentioned. Okay, so throughout our, um, our training today, we're going to be focusing on this um, campaign, which is not actually hypothetical. It's something that is happening right now. 
um, but we're going to be using it as an example as we go through some of these exercises. Uh, so here's the scenario. The San Diego Unified School District has a school board stacked with five out of five progressive votes. The timing is perfect to push for a resolution to commit the school system to go fossil fuel free by 2030. How do we get there? And let me pause and just ask if anyone has any questions about that scenario right now. That kind of made sense. What do you mean by fossil fuel free? Is that all renewable energy? Is that no um, gas fuel? Is that all electric cars? It, um, all, what does that exactly mean? All of the above, all operations, buildings, fleets, procurement, energy purchasing, everything. No fossil fuels in the mix, all 100% clean, safe, renewable energy. Um, so we're talking solar, solar panel retrofitting, uh, battery storage, buying all renewable energy, electric vehicles, the works, right? Um, yes, great question. Okay, I'm gonna go back to um, back to my slides. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do when planning a campaign is we wanna use an equity filter. And an, an equity filter is just an idea of asking ourselves some questions right at the beginning to make sure that we're focusing on justice and we're focusing on equity. And the filter kind of helps us sort out the good ideas from the bad. So when we use an equity filter, we wanna ask who is most impacted by this issue? Are they represented at the table? What biases does your group have and how can they be countered? How will this campaign's objectives affect racial, gender, and class inequity? And what unintended consequences for frontline communities need to be avoided? So these questions are in the worksheet, which I linked. Um, and if you're just joining us, I'll put the worksheet in the chat one more time. I wanted to ask what your thoughts were. Um, I wanna keep this participatory. If we're thinking about our scenario of getting the school board to commit to 100% renewable energy, no fossil fuels, let's look at the first question. Who is most impacted by this issue and are they represented at our table? So who's most impacted by the current status quo of using fossil fuels and emitting greenhouse gases and causing global warming. And anyone feel free to unmute and, and chime in. I know children. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say children, go ahead. Yeah. There children. are neighborhoods yeah. where, yeah, where the, the air emissions and the pollution in general is just horrific. And it's usually in lower income areas. Mm. So young people, children suffering from pollution, uh, environmental racism, impacting you know low income communities of color, communities of concern, being more polluted. Um, what else? There's probably more to say about uh, who's most impacted by climate change, right? I mean, other than the main answer that everybody is impacted. Um, I think if we're just going to keep a focus on just the schools, I mean, obviously the children, the staff that's there, the communities in the neighborhood, um, and in especially predominantly um, community concern. Thank you, Tanisha. Yes, yeah, so everybody's impacted by climate change, but communities of concern disproportionately get those impacts, right? Low income communities, people of color. If we look at a global perspective, we're talking about the global south right, um, formerly colonized parts of the world. Um, climate justice is a concept that the, or rather climate injustice is a concept that the people least responsible for causing climate change are actually suffering the worst impacts from it, right? So when we talk about climate justice, we talk, we were, we're really trying to rectify that wrong and make sure that the people least responsible who are suffering the worst impacts are getting the majority of, of the aid and that our resources are going there. That's kind of what the justice perspective gives us. Um, looking at our other questions, well, let's let's use our group um, as an example here. So we've got we've got me, Juanita, Kathy, Jenny, Evan, and Tanisha, and we've asked who's most impacted by climate change. Let's ask, are they represented at our table right now? Let's say let's say the six of us want to plan this campaign. 
and we're using our equity filter. Do we have representation from the most impacted groups here today? I would say yes and no. Uh, well, I def I'm definitely um, representing Community Concern. And uh, I'm a part of Mothers Out Front, um, which is an organization that keeps children, especially um, not just our own children, but children just in general, um, at the forefront of thought when we're moving forward with campaigns. And so there might not be a child, like an actual physical child in our group, but being a mother, uh, definitely uh, sending representation for children. Awesome. Thanks, Tanisha. Um, I have so, a question. Go ahead, please. Yep. No, I, I just, um, when you say that like certain communities are impacted more, I can you just kind of explain why that is? Because it's it's hard for me to understand because everyone is impacted by it, but I don't really understand how um, certain communities are impacted more like lower income. That's a great question. And thank you for asking. Um, my initial answer is that if, we, if we're looking at income inequality or wealth inequality, um, yes, everyone will be impacted by climate change, but those of us with more resources will be better equipped to adapt. We'll be more able to move if we need to. We'll be more able to pay for retrofitting where we live to protect ourselves from extreme weather. Um, whereas people with access to less resources will be less able to, to adapt in that way. And if you look at, you know, at, a, at it from a global perspective in terms of rich nations and um, uh, underdeveloped nations, that is even more stark, right? Um, mm -hmm. Nations with e extensive infrastructure and communications infrastructure and transportation infrastructure are gonna be better positioned to adapt to extreme weather to crop shortages, to rising seas, whereas poorer nations are, um, are already struggling to manage public health crises, are already struggling to, um, to feed their population, are already struggling with high rates of poverty, and that'll all only be exacerbated by, by an unstable and more dangerous climate. Um, and I see Tanisha also has her hand up. Just because I, I know that I definitely come across that, that question and, and sometimes it's easier to give an exact example, like a real life, especially us in the city. And so I would say, you know, a lot of the home housing and communities are concerned, we don't have um, central heat and air, let alone. So when it's really hot, the entire family has to come into the living room to get a little bit of air, the cool air coming up from the one little wall heater or wall air conditioner and that also goes when it's really cold how everyone has to come into the living room and kind of camp out to get heat um, at the night now obviously that's all over I'm sure the city of San Diego has homes like that but in particularly in communities of concern that is just one aspect um, that has to deal with it another is um, if you know the city very well um, and especially knowing the freeways there are so many elementary schools and middle schools that are right next and right on top of where the freeways are in particular even if you know where if you ever go on the 94 freeway gompers preparatory school is literally like you see it at nighttime it's flashed out like it's a rave going on <laughs> with the sign that's there um, but when you pass it by it's obviously they've taken down the trees to make sure the building looks nice but now that school the children there are very really impacted with now asthma increases um, just on the, of not having really good air to breathe, being right next to a freeway. So those are just two examples of how it's really impacted onto it. Not only that, but homelessness, when people are, really, are homeless, there is no escape from heat or from um, um, the cold. And so with that, and libraries don't always want you in there, right? There, there's still a business that needs to happen. And so there's nowhere for them to be at. There's no, and especially in Houston, there's not enough trees for shade. So a lot of times homeless are not usually in really affluent neighborhoods. They're usually in communities of concern. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Um, I would also just add that the, the scary thing about climate change is that it's really talking, uh, it, it's really projected to destabilize society, which can lead to, I mean, it's, it's predicted by social scientists and researchers uh, to lead to, 
an increase in various kinds of violence. Um, so people who are demographics and constituents, um, constituencies who are already at risk for types of violence, for example, women, for example, the disabled, um, for example, the LGBTQ community, um, as society becomes potentially more dangerous as a result of the climate becoming more dangerous, all of those at-risk groups only become more at risk. And that's something with a lot of social science research behind it um, that, you can, that you can look up as well. And Kathy has her hand up. Um, I, I would also say um, viruses and um, illnesses uh, due to um, climate change as far as um, um, that there's gonna be more and more of that. We've already saw how the pandemic impacted communities of concern and that's also it. Um, I also, I sit on a school board in Carlsbad. And so um, one of the things we've been able to get, um, most of our schools have some aspect of solar panels um, on the schools. And one of the advantages of working with the schools is oftentimes they are in the middle of communities and they're not in session every day. And so all that renewable energy that they're generating when the school's not in session, that renewable energy can go into the community. So when they're when the schools are not in session, and you know that's all summer long, hopefully when there's lots of sunshine, and so it's a way of getting renewable energy in schools. That's how we have additional representation in this small group, is because if you know if we're working with our schools and our communities, that's a way to get more renewable energy into our communities of concern. Thanks, Kathy. And Tanisha, is your hand still up from earlier, or do you have another point? I'm so sorry. Nope. I'm going to take it down. No worries. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, Juanita, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I think you're on mute. If you want to unmute yourself, Juanita. Yep. There we go. Um, yeah, I think historically, um, lower income neighborhoods have been the dumping ground for the, the kinds of processes that we rely on to create the kinds of things that we use in our in our society. Um, one specific area that comes to mind in, in San Diego is the Barrio Logan, Logan Heights area. They're right near where, you know, all of the, the uh, shipments from overseas come in and those big old trucks drive through there and they just spew out diesel and that the particulates from diesel are, are horrendous. And I, I think if this, the last time I read that that area was still the worst area for, for children with asthma. Um, and I know they're talking electric trucks and I, I, I think that area is now sort of being gentrified a bit, um, but it's, it's just the pattern, you know, whether it was incinerators or, you know, where they put a, a you know, what are those little, whatever they're called to pump oil out of the ground in Oklahoma or something. Um, recently reading articles, they're right in people's neighborhoods. So, you know, we have a, we have a, a poor history of, of taking into consideration in these communities of concern. I, I live in Barrio Logan. <laughs> yeah, so- and I, know, I know there's been some things about, um, there's a, some plant a few streets over that emits a lot of um, really bad things <laughs> into the air. But I but I also know that it's a community that's very proactive and a very tight community and um, a, a lot of really good things go on here. And I, I, I just think that um, that they're they're open to making this a really great place for people to live. Oh yeah, absolutely, Jenny. Um, yeah, I, I think what, uh, what a lot of people here are just pointing to is these ideas of environmental racism and how that plays into mm -hmm. geography and urban design, how poor communities, which are often communities of color, uh, uh, communities of, of uh, you know, of migrants um, are often live in places where heavy industry is placed, where, where highways are, are built through. There, there's the whole history in this country of, of redlining, which is another topic which you can look up, but it has to do with, it has to do with racist urban design that's, that's well understood and, and well studied. Um, the history of highway development, um, which neighborhoods are, are close to heavy industry. 
there's there's a racial and there's a class dimension to, to all of that history. And then when we're talking about climate change on a planetary scale, it's sort of the same phenomenon just on a global scale. And so that, that's really just the idea of environmental justice and, and climate justice. And, yeah. and that's why it's so important to use an equity filter when we're planning a, a climate related campaign so that we're really making sure that people who are from those uh, communities that are gonna be most impacted, that are least responsible for the problem are at the table with us, that their concerns are being elevated, that their perspectives are being elevated, that they're invited into the room, they feel safe, included, they can speak for themselves. Um, and that's just really an essential an essential part of building a campaign, and that's you know San, that's a, that's for San Diego 350 and a lot of climate groups and environmental groups. Um, you know that's that's what we think first. We think how is this going to serve environmental justice, and and so I'd like to keep moving in the presentation. Uh, the other questions uh, you, you can take a look at your at your worksheet, um, but other questions to ask yourself when using an equity filter are things like well how will this campaign's objectives affect uh, racial, gender, and class uh, inequity? And what unintended consequences for frontline communities, um, and frontline communities is a term we're gonna get to, um, need to be avoided. Um, so I'd like to move on, but th those can be questions that you can consider and, and, and keep the worksheet for your reference. Um, I'd like to go back to my slides. Okay, so the next idea in planning your campaign is this idea of finding your front line. And um, people use these terms differently, but I'd like to propose for this presentation two slightly related terms. One is impacted community and one is frontline community. Um, and this comes from the organizing Cools the Planet pamphlet. Um, for an impacted community, we're talking about people who feel the burden of climate injustice. So we've been saying, communities of concern, low-income communities of color. Um, but th then a frontline community is people who are organized around that impact. So if you're a community that's feeling the disproportionate impact of a problem, you're an impacted community. If you're then organizing around that impact and working together to change that status quo, then you've become a frontline community. And it's kind of like, you know, a military metaphor, right? You're at the front line of a war. And maybe we don't have to think about it in terms of a war, but that's just how the metaphor is, right? It's just the idea of you're being your community or you are being harmed somehow by the status quo and you're organizing around that and trying to change that. And that makes you a frontline community. Um, and, can I, and, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, oh, sorry I was gonna put my hand in. But um, can I, so just um, to bring up the example of Barrio Logan. So, um, obviously, uh, it, it's understood that Barrio Logan is definitely an impacted community. However, especially hearing that um, there's lots going on and they're, and they're banding together and, and, and being very proactive, does that now make them a frontline or are they still an impacted? Is there one that would be that kind of has a hierarchy of others, even if they are, you know what I'm saying, if they're doing things to be frontline, does that kind of overshadow that the fact that they're impacted, that they that, that now change their narrative? It's a really good question. I think uh, on this kind of way of thinking about it, frontline community is like a subset of an impacted community. If you think of like a Venn diagram, there's like the impacted community, and then part of that is the frontline community. Of um, and and I would say more broadly, I think a lot of people use frontline community to just mean impacted community. In, in this case, it's kind of a terminological thing, but I think the main distinction that I wanted to make is that. Some communities are being disproportionately harmed, but then also you can get organized around that harm. And that's the difference. Um, and then to go back to the slides, we are gonna, um, and you can look at your worksheet as well that, um, and if you're just joining us, I will once more put the worksheet in the chat so you can take a look at that. Um, we're gonna do a little exercise where we find our front line and we use a little three-part Venn diagram to do so. So let me share my screen one more time. Okay, so your front line, and everybody has a front line. Your front line is the intersection of your need or hurt, how you're being harmed or what you need, plus the resources or power that you have access to, plus your position 
relative to you know the power holders in society who determine what's happening and, and are controlling the status quo. So let me explain what I mean by that. If you look at my chart here, you can see in the, in the first uh, column is your community's need. And you can ask yourself, well, how are you being hurt? What change do you seek, you or your community, any, any group that you identify with? In the second column, it's your, your community's resources or power. What resources do you have access to? And resources could be money, it could be material goods, but it could also be human resources. It could be your networks, your, your, um, your relationships, your access to institutions, perhaps. Um, perhaps your ability to have a voice um, even through social media channels, right? All of these things can be resources or a, a tool for, for you to build power. And then in the third column, we have our, our point of in intervention. How can we intervene in the status quo? Where do or can you come into contact with power and where can you make a difference? So let me stop sharing, but if you wanna um, look at your worksheet, it has that, um, it has a Venn diagram with those three columns. And let's do an exercise where we think about our school board campaign, right? And we're thinking about the people here in this room. There's seven of us now. We're gonna have a campaign to get the school board to, to electrify everything. Let's start by identifying our need or our harm or how we're being harmed by the status quo. And I think some of us have already said, everyone is harmed by climate change, right? So right off the bat, we just by being people who live on earth, we are harmed by climate change. But would anyone want to add anything more specific to that? Of how you, you or your community is being harmed by the status quo of, of climate change? Um, you, you could put an economic piece on it too, because it's a lot more expensive to, um, uh, for instance, um, our electric bill went down by about $300,000 a year. Um, when we went solar. And so, and those are taxpayer dollars. So the taxpayers are overpaying for gasoline, for the cars. Um, they're also overpaying for the electricity, for the schools and those types of things. So that's just, again, a different approach, but it's a, you know, it gets us to the same place. That's a terrific, terrific point. Thank you, Kathy. Would anyone else want to add anything of just how you or your community is being harmed by climate change? I can go next. So um, the city um, is working on things um, for our climate action plans, um, as well as something called reach codes. And what reach codes are is basically saying that all new buildings uh, will be basically solar paneled and very um, moving with the times that we need to be in to make sure that it's a very smart home. However, there's not a lot of new infrastructure happening in communities of concern, in particular Southeast San Diego. Um, and so when there's not new buildings coming forward, the benefits of coming into these new policies leaves the community's concern out. Nice, so even, even as new policies are developed, if they're not using an equity filter, if they're not focused on environmental justice, they could be leaving out the very groups and communities that, that need that, those resources the most. That's a great point. Um, would anyone else like to add one more thing to just how are you or your community being harmed or uh, harmed by the status quo of climate change or have a need that you, that you need to change the status quo somehow? I'm, I'm gonna jump in. Um, maybe also education in the sense of we probably aren't doing enough to put the focus at all levels on educating about climate change. What is really, because there's probably a lot of people out there that aren't like, we're only seven here that are doing something. Plus there's hundreds of people out there, but then there's, are we really putting a program in place to educate that next generation? Hmm. So, so maybe there's a need for, um, for better education. Yeah. Right? That could be that could be great. So anything we can think of that feels like somehow that we're being harmed or we have some need to change, that's part of your front line. The next element of, your, of our front line 
is what resources or power do you have access to? We all have, we all have some power. Even just the ability to use our voice and speak, that's power, right? Um, a single human relationship, that's some power. You can build some solidarity, right? So again, let's, let's think about now more people are joining us here. We have eight now. Um, the eight of us in our school board campaign, what resources do we have access to? And I'll start and say, um, I'm a parent. I have, I have a young toddler and I can speak from my position as being a parent and that can be more persuasive to the school board, for example, right? If I'm, if I'm a parent with a, with, a, with a student in the system, she's not there yet, but in a few years she will be, um, then perhaps that gives me some power just from uh, power to speak persuasively and be listened to. Uh, but, but what do other people think? What, what resources do we have access to? What, what's our power? board member uh, in Carlsbad. Um, and so, um, but I do have connections with other school board members, in, like in San Diego and those types of things. So that's one piece. And then the other piece is I'm a voter. You know, I, I vote for these people you know, or, or not vote for these people. So um, that's another way, uh, it's another place of power. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Go ahead, Juanita. What comes to mind for me is I'm a grandmother and I'm retired, um, but so I have time. And so I think investing my time in learning, um, like we're doing right now, you know, coming to investing my time in, in groups of communities where I can get to know the pulse of what's happening and contribute my voice and my, you know, my time and my effort and talents or whatever you want to call it uh, to build to build a bigger a bigger group of of community that wants to make change time is absolutely a resource absolutely a source of power that's a great point um and i would just add for those of us who have uh, some money to give that's obviously a resource right if we can contribute funds to a campaign that's that's an additional source of power, right? Okay, now finally, the final component of finding our front line is figuring out what are our points of intervention? And that means where can we actually direct our energies to make a difference where it matters, right? Because we could really care about an issue, we could be really passionately motivated, we could be very educated about it, and we could post on social media about that. And that will educate our social media friends, right? Um, or we could we could stand by the, we could stand by the road and, and wave a sign, and that'll you know spread the message to the people who drive by, right? But those might not be the most strategic, effective places to intervene if we're really trying to change society. We want to think about what's our actual opportunity where we can devote our limited resources to make a difference. So again, thinking about our school board example. What are our points of intervention for, for getting the school board to adopt a new policy? What do y'all think? To start us off, I'll say the school board meets um, monthly. They have, they have meetings that are public. So, one point of intervention is showing up at those public meetings and giving comments, right? What are other ways to influence the school board? We could call them or email them, right? We could, we could request meetings with individual school board members or their staff. Um, so those are just a few ideas to get us thinking of where could we where are our points of intervention? And then finally, you put all three of these things together, your need, your power, and your points of intervention, and that's your front line. So it might be something like, if we combine everything we've said, I might say, 
you know, because I'm a human who will be harmed by climate change, I am going to use my time that I have that I have available to me and my position uh, as as um, as a parent um, to to call to do some research and uh, contact a school board member and ask for a meeting, right? So we've taken all three things and we and we've put it all together and we found our front line. And the reason that's that would be, you know, in this hypothetical situation, that's my front line is that I'll I'll be acting from my own place of need. I know I know that it's in my interest to not be harmed by climate change, right? I know that I have the time and my position as a parent. That's that's my identity and its resources that I have available to me. And I know that I can intervene strategically by getting a meeting with a school board member. And so this exercise has gotten us from being concerned about climate change and having a big goal of wanting to get the school board to adopt a policy. And it's figured out a way that we can make the specific difference that, that we can make in an effective way. So does that make sense? Are there any questions about that, that frontline exercise? It works for every issue. If you go through those steps, it'll help you figure out where you can make a difference. Okay, awesome. I see some thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you for the, the feedback. I'm gonna go back to my slides. Okay, the next step is we need to build coalition. Another way of thinking about that is we need to align our front lines with others front lines. And so there are just some important questions to ask yourself when you start coalition building. You just wanna ask, well, what's another community or group of people, whatever, with something in common with your need or your power or your points of intervention? So all those three components of the front line exercise we did, is there another group of people that has some overlap with one of those, they could be in our coalition. We have something in common with them. Uh, you wanna ask, well, what do they have in common, but also what are the differences and how can we leverage the commonalities and also navigate the differences? And I wanna just show a list of coalition building do's and don'ts. And um, these are all lessons that I've learned over the years of doing uh, community organizing and activism. So when you're reaching out to another group, you know, maybe a partner organization, don't show up uninformed. Instead, do research on the partner organization in advance. Don't only talk about your work, but do come with meaningful questions about their work. Don't talk only in terms of tasks that you wanna do. Do share each other's purpose and motivation in doing this work. Don't assume you understand their politics or motivation. We all come at these issues, which are very complex from a variety of different perspectives. And again, we have some things in common and some things not in common. So instead of assuming you understand the other person's motivation and their politics, do seek to understand and find common core values, desires, purposes. Try to ground it in, in purpose. Um, don't only make asks of them. Instead, do offer to support their work. Don't speak in vague terms, but instead do look for a concrete action to take together right away. Don't just have one meeting and then move on to the next thing, but do follow up, maintain a sustained relationship and show up for each other. And I wanted to ask if there were any questions or comments about that list. And I'll leave the list up. So just go ahead and unmute and, and shout out if you have a question or comment. not hearing any questions or comments. Go ahead. I, I think it's pretty straightforward. I, I like what, what I'm seeing. And I think it's important to, like you said, keep that, also that communication open to what could they, like almost kind of going in there and saying, hey, you know, I think you guys would be great resource for us because we want to see how you can help us add to our, our, you know, our plans that will help us 
both you and in, in whatever, like in the food sources, because ultimately that affects our, you know, our planet in, in the sense of the environment. And so, I mean, so I think it's good that what you have up here, I mean, I see how you can really mesh with another group, knowing what they do and what you do, but bringing it together. So you almost become a team. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the goal ultimately is to be a team and find something specific you can do together because we're really only successful as grassroots groups, as activist groups, as volunteer-based groups, when we, when we work with other groups who have similar but different missions and we find specific things we can do together. It increases our numbers. And then it also builds solidarity. It builds relationships. And, um, and, and that helps all of us on, on, on our various missions. I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay, so this is like maybe a little intellectual, but it's worth considering on some level. We have to understand that society's status quo is perpetuated by forces, including human desire, state power, technology, and geography, and structures like race, class, and sexuality or gender. Um, so we should ask ourselves, well, what are the forces and structures perpetuating fossil fuel dependence and planetary heating or global warming or climate change? And that, uh, that lets us ask, well, who or what are the agents of change? Who can actually make a difference? The idea here is that if you want to change society, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about campaigning, we're talking about changing society. You have to understand society in order to change it, right? In order to be effective and strategic. So I wanted to just ask, um, here, I'll, I'll copy this question and put it in the chat so I can, um, so I can see everyone. But I did want to just uh, leave a little space for a little brainstorm. What are the forces and structures that are perpetuating our use of fossil fuels? What, why are we still using fossil fuels decades after we've understood that we need to stop using them to prevent the planet from heating? Need money. Read money. Yeah, say more about that. Yep. I'm a dependency. We've created a, a society that's dependent on it because had we not been so dependent back in the days, I mean, we've restructured the way fo fossil fuels are being done. We make it better, healthier, cleaner air. They do all these things, but they've made us dependent on it. So now it's like, you got to get off that heroin to, to, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a dependency. It's, that's where the, the other link is, you know? Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with greed. These big companies are making money and how do they stop making money if they get rid of it? So, and at the end of the day, it's humanity that's being affected. Even those people that are making money, you're affecting your next generation and generation after that. So I look at it more for me, it's a humanity. I mean, we're, we're taking away, we can wipe ourselves out if we don't do something. I mean, that's what we're ultimately going to do, unfortunately. Thank you, JD. Um, your, your Zoom screen says JD. Is, is that what you'd prefer to be called? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, JD, for your comments. I think what I would highlight of all of that is you mentioned greed, money, and big companies we're basically talking about the profit motive and capitalism, right? There's money to be made um, in continuing to extract, sell, and, and, and use fossil fuels. And, um, and, and those companies have, have chosen over the decades to continue making a profit, even though they know, they know that their business model is creating harm to everybody, but especially communities of concern, um, and is threatening the habitability of the planet we live on. And I think you mentioned addiction as well. And I think there is a there's a societal uh, element of addiction as well to these um, to these dangerous sources of fuel. So thank you, JD. Did anyone else want to comment on this question of just what are the forces and structures that are keeping us using fossil fuels, even though we know we shouldn't? I really like that JD used the term addiction. I think that's a, actually a good one that I don't think we really use um, a lot going forward. And so the three that came to mind for me was 
just creatures of habit, comfortability, and monopoly. And so just kind of quickly leading to that, just creatures of habit. We Being in South of San Diego, we've been talking to our elders to let them know, hey, we have these um, stoves. We're trying to replace the electric from your gas stoves um, because there's a lot of you know issues that come with gas but other than their own health with it, but just other risk factors. And so, and the fact that we want to get them out just for the fossil fuel um, and take that it takes. And they are not very happy. They are like, look, it helps me cook. Oh, it's what I'm used to, it's what I know. Um, and so it's just the fact of addiction would change. <laughs> Um, is one thing. Um, the also thing that's come, there's a lot that comes with that now. You have to either charge it at home. Um, the amount, I mean, it takes to just the payment of making sure that I, I'm able to do that at home or you have to sit for a while to have it charged somewhere versus how quickly gas goes in um, to your vehicle. So just the comfort there. And with Monopoly, I mean, it's difficult to do anything that's not supporting fossil fuel. So even for the fact, I know we've recently just had like, are talking about banks and how cut your credit cards if it's, you know, your bank doesn't. And really what bank out here is not doing something that's detrimental to our environment, to our planet. And so with that in mind, well then do I just not have a bank account? And how difficult is that now when everything is a credit card, everything needs, I can't even get a car rental now unless I have a credit card. You know, so um, I think the world alone, it, it's very difficult to make any moves um, with the monopoly of just these big corporations, um, including our own banks that are supporting um, fossil fuel endeavors. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Uh, and Peter, I wanted to um, I wanted to correct you when you said capitalism. It's crony capitalism because ultimately they're getting subsidies. So the fossil fuel is getting subsidies. So they're keeping the price to where we, you know, it's it's more affordable. Um, animal agriculture is being subsidized to keep it to where it's more affordable. There's no broccoli lobby, but there's certainly a beef lobby, for instance. And um, so ultimately, I mean, it. I agree that there's monopolies and that there's making lots of profit and, you know, we are, um, we're addicted, but it's also our government that keeps us that way because they continue to use our own taxpayer dollars to fund, to keep the prices low, to keep us addicted. Thanks, Kathy, for that point. And I want to start by saying we might not all agree on our kind of theoretical orientation, but I would challenge your perspective in one way. One, if you're familiar with the concept of neoliberalism, it's kind of a, 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 an economic theory of the time we live in since about 1970 through the present. And a key feature of neoliberalism is exactly what you just said of using the state through things like subsidies um, to actually mandate uh, participation in profitable industries and to keep people uh, uh, purchasing things from uh, profit-seeking companies and um, essentially using state power to support corporate profits. So I think what you're calling crony capitalism, uh, some you know some writers and theorists have called neoliberalism, and so it's. It's when you really get into the the kind of theory about it, you know, it, these it gets complicated, right? And we don't have to get super deep into it. Um, and then, um, and then I would also just recommend if you find uh, the book, the best selling book by Naomi Klein, um, "This Changes Everything: Capitalism Versus the Climate." She makes a really compelling case that it's it's capitalism itself. It's this it's this idea of infinite growth, infinite economic growth driven by the profit motive that is like fundamental to the problem. But I'll just leave that for, you know, as a recommendation to look into that. But I, I really appreciate your, your comment as well. Um, I do wanna go back to the slides and say, now that we've kind of thought a little bit about how society works, and of course we're not, all, we're not gonna get all the answers and we might not even agree. But once we've stimulated a little bit of thought about how society works, we can ask ourselves, well, how can we change it? And I want to share San Diego 350's uh, theory of change. So San Diego 350's theory of change is 
in a word, in a phrase, grassroots mobilization. Uh, we believe that if a lot more people were demanding action in every forum, uh, so in local governments, uh, in the media, in your workplaces, uh, through your, your homes and through your churches, um, demanding action in every forum, that will drive change because the political and economic establishment has refused to act on their own. Again, we've, we've understood the science of climate change for over 30 years and it's been, it's been well accepted and governments have been fully informed and industrial leaders have been fully informed. And yet the establishment has shown for a generation that they will not act on this information. So we think a lot more people demanding action everywhere will drive that change. We also think that local action and policy to reduce emissions is achievable and effective. And achievable and effective is really important. You wanna have goals that you can actually reach to have that success uh, and then give yourself something to build on. Um, and then we also think local action is effective um, because a lot of policy uh, is actually implemented at the local level. And, um, you know, as a society, again, to go back to addiction, we're a little bit addicted to following national politics. It's kind of a spectator sport, right? But actually a tremendous amount of things that really impact the world and affect people's lives are happening at the local level. So we think local action is achievable and effective. Uh, and then our final component is we think there should be a connection to a lar larger global movement because that helps motivate people and better leverage everyone's efforts. And San Diego 350, like all the 350 groups are, around the world are, um, are part of the 350.org uh, global network, right? So we're not really partner, or, we're not chapters of a, of a large organization, we're independent groups, but we're part of this global network. So that's San Diego 350's theory of change. A lot of people demanding action locally connected to a larger global movement. And I just wanted to ask if there are any questions or comments about that. I'll just comment that um, I know you pretty well now, Peter, a couple of times, maybe not in person yet, <laughs> but um, I'm, I am vigilant. I'm making sure to stay connected with Santa Cruz 50 because truly this organization is doing many things and not just speaking about it, but taking action, including rallies where I had the privilege to speak at being a part of um, even this group here. Um, it's not necessarily that I need to learn so much, but it's the fact of just being united and being able to speak to others that I feel like have the same concerns. Um, and that makes us a stronger uh, community, especially a San Diego city, um, especially those that wanna fight for the same justices, the same concerns that we have that um, are all on, on the forefront of our minds. And so um, I think San Diego 50 is doing an amazing job and um, I definitely appreciate all the emails and really staying current um, that the organization puts out. Th thank you for saying that, Tanisha. And it's been great to get to know you as well. And and Tanisha, you, you represent many organizations, right? Uh, what I know you're uh, you're with the Urban Sustainability uh, Collaborative, or did I get that right? Yeah, oh, man, the, the hats have lessened since 2020, I will say. However, yeah, um, so I am the Climate Community Director with San Diego Urban Sustainability Coalition. We primarily focus on environmental justice, climate justice, um, sustainability and equity in communities of concern and particular Southeast San Diego, which is the main red line district for the city. Um, I'm also on the steering committee for San Diego Green New Deal. Um, definitely a, an active member of San Diego 350 um, with our climate leadership um, group that we have. And I am the chair for um, the equity working group for San Diego Building Electrification Coalition. And that's just the actual name titles of something versus um, just being a part of groups to obviously hear more what's going on with communities. Um, and recently actually just kind of signed on with the San Diego Fleet Center um, with um, an initiative to hopefully bring more into Southeast San Diego. Incredible, Tanisha. Thank you for thank you for everything you do. It's inspiring. I, I think we met through the um, steering committee for the Green New Deal Coalition, which we're both on. Um, but we, our paths cross many times. Um, so everybody, at this point, I would like to just take a short break because we've been at it for about an hour and we have uh, plenty more to go. And I want to make sure we're done. Um, by 7.30, which is in uh, about 50 minutes. So I'll just uh, offer everyone to take a five minute break. Um, feel free to mute yourself, go off camera, 
use the restroom, get a snack, whatever you need, and we will be back in uh, just about four or five minutes and we'll get started again. We'll get started again in just one minute. Okay, if everyone wants to uh, join us again, we're ready to get started for the second half of our training. Okay, so uh, it's, it's, a cum it's a cumulative process. And now that we've been through uh, using our equity filter, identifying our front line, thinking about coalition building uh, and thinking about our theory of society and our theory of change, we are actually ready to do what's called a power map. And this is a really, really important exercise for any campaign. You always wanna do a power map, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so again, we're gonna stick with our example, pardon me, uh, of the group of us here want to do a campaign to get the school board to go all electric, to go fossil fuel free. We want to think of every individual, uh, group, organization, anything like that, who might be who might have some power to make a difference and uh, influence that outcome. And and power, of course, is just the ability to get what you want, the ability to do what you want to do. So any individual or group 
who might have the power to influence the school board, we want to put on our power map. And the way I have laid out this power map, and um, some people do it differently, there's a lot of options, it's just a tool. Uh, I have uh, in on the columns from left to right, we have um, what's also called the spectrum of allies and opposition. We have all the way on the left in the yellow active support. Um, moving to the right, we have passive support. Um, in the middle, we have neutral. And then in the purple, we have passive opposition and then active opposition. So these are individuals or, group, or groups who either um, actively support our goal, actively oppose our goal, or are somewhere along the spectrum in the middle. Then if you look at the rows, uh, the dark gray, light gray, and, and the lightest gray, uh, we have kind of like tiers of power. So across the top are the power holders. Th those are the individuals or groups who literally just can make a decision. They have the power to just say yes or no to what we want. So in our case, that's the school board. If, if we're trying to get the school board to pass a resolution, the power holders are the school board. They can just meet and take a vote and just do it. If you go down a tier, we have influencers. These are individuals or groups who can influence the school board. They don't directly have the power to get the outcome we want themselves, but they can, but they have a they, they have the ear of the power holders. They have an avenue to directly influence them. And then the bottom tier. I call the secondary influencers. These are basically individuals or groups who could influence the influencers, right? They don't have direct access to the power holders, but they do have direct access to other individuals or groups who themselves have direct access to the power holders. So I know it gets a little complicated, but it's worth thinking through all of this as we're planning our campaign. Um, so this chart is on your worksheet as well. And uh, if you've just joined us, I will put the link to the worksheet in the chat again. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing here. And so if you want to just refer to your worksheet, I wonder if we can think about our school board campaign and just start brainstorming who are individuals or groups who might have some influence on the outcome we want. And, and to get us started, the obvious one is the power holders, the school board, right? Um, and we've said that they're a progressive school board. Um, I might put them as passive, passive support. They might like the idea of, of passing a resolution to go all electric, but they might not be championing it. They might not be actively supporting it. So I would put the school board uh, in the top row uh, in the second column under passive support power holders. But let's brainstorm together. Who are some other individuals or groups who might influence the school board? The PTA parents. Exactly. Um, so individual parents, but also organized through the PTA, right? Would you, uh, JD, would you put um, the PTA they're not power holders themselves, right? They, they can't vote for the outcome we want, but would you put them as influencers because they could influence the school board? Definitely. They, they have some power because their children are going there. I mean, the outcome is ultimately um, put pressure from the parents, the, PT, the, the, the board has to do something. Absolutely. Um, and then where would you put them left to right on the spectrum of allies and opposition? Um, I don't really know actually uh, in, in, in real terms, like what the PTA for the San Diego Unified School District is like, but do you think they would be, how supportive or opposed do you think they'd be as an organization to our goal of, of getting the school board to electrify? Well, I think you, you could break it down probably by the first motive is to be part of the PTA because you want your children to get a good education, number one. Number two, they're taxpayers, so they're paying into that. And if your child is going to school where their electric bill is going to be cut and there is going to also save the environment for their future, it's like a double thing. So I think it's also about how you present the agenda, because it is an agenda, ultimately of how it's gonna benefit them. 
So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you if you look at it from the tax dollars end of it and the cost, and then you look at the environment, and then you look at the part that it's much better for your children, and ultimately it's a better resource. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's so, so many ways to break it down. Yeah, I, That's all I can think of. No, th those are great thoughts. Yeah, it's it's such a complicated issue. There would be a tax burden, but there are the, the positive health impacts. Um, th there may be other concerns about priorities, right? A, a, P a PTA organization may be primarily concerned with, you know, putting funds into the classroom, uh, into having quality education. Maybe school safety would be high on their list. Maybe fighting climate change might not be the top priority, right, of a PTA. So. We don't know, right? They, they might be neutral. They might even be passively opposed to our goal. We don't know. We'd have to figure it they, out. They actually are passively in favor. Um, they, they do have a, they do have a, a statewide resolution um, for climate change and that sort of thing. So they actually could be a, um, a, one of our coalition partners in this effort, potentially. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for educating us. Awesome. You're welcome. Okay. Great. So let's think of one one more individual or group who we should put on our power map. We've got the school board. We've got the PTA. Maybe let's think of like um, let's think of a secondary influencer. Who's an individual or group who could influence the PTA? The teachers. The teachers themselves. Yeah. It may be a. Uh, would it be like a teachers union or some other kind of organization? Yes, I would say the teachers union oftentimes uh, within there, they have uh, like a caucus, like an environmental caucus or what have you um, that could influence, that could internally influence and then externally influence from there. Nice. And then I'm gonna say one more too, the children, the kids, the students, they got the loudest voices and, and it's affecting them. I mean, you know, if you look at that that side of it, they can be good influencers because they will spread the word. They will demand that their school be part of what is going to save their future. So I, I would think that high schoolers, you know, when you get to that level of understanding more, I think they're they could be good influencers if they're molded into understanding the importance of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree too and say, you know, children are all, they always make um, amazing um, statements because it definitely is genuine, comes from the heart. I know that I've heard younger children, like elementary school, um, were there with their parents and in and, um, and support of, you know, what as a group had something to say. And honestly, I mean, I know it's not a person or an organization, but putting on there just the system of how we're able to address is I would something I would like to kind of look into because it can be a little frustrating to feel like you're talking to a wall. Like literally you do speak at the very end of the meetings, right? To be able to say we've gotten 500 signatures and so forth. And, or, you know, you've had now five parents speak and they move on from the next, next and nothing ever really good. It's addressed at that moment. And then when the next meeting starts, it's not like they go, okay, so with the last meeting, we had the five parents with this and blah, blah, blah. And then, so they address it. it. Sometimes it can feel like you're literally just wasting breath because there's never, there's no, there's not even really facial expression coming back. It's kind of like they're just sitting sternly um, and letting us just speak. And I know that has deterred many people. Um, I know I'm, I'm visually trying to, I want to continue to make sure they hear my voice, but I know that there's many people that who feel like there's not, there's no point in speaking to them because there's, they don't feel like they get answers back in a way they feel is appropriate to them. But also I do understand that because we speak to them and they don't address it at the next meeting as far as individually, even if you wanna group it. You know, we had six people talk about feel free schools. Let's talk a little bit about it. It seems to be kind of just goes into the air and then just kind of dissipates. Tanisha, such great points. I think that um, that engages with our idea from earlier of the points of intervention. Like you're, you're talking about giving like non-agenda public comment at the school board where anyone can just show up and speak, but you're saying it like doesn't make a big difference. Maybe that's like not the most strategic point of intervention to just show mm -hmm. up, right? Maybe a more strategic point of intervention would be like somehow somehow trying to get a meeting with a school board member or their staff um, as opposed to just showing up at a public meeting, right? Um, or maybe 
it's more effective to show up as an organized group uh, at the public comments as opposed to just an individual. Um, and then I also wanted to say on the uh, on the issue of the the PTA and the teachers union and the students themselves, I think all of those would belong in the influencer row. All, all of those groups have direct influence over the school board. I think the school board cares what students say. They care what the parents say. They care what the, what the teachers say. Um, excuse me. I think a secondary influencer might almost be something like, like a social media influencer, right? Say there's someone who has a following among high schoolers. Maybe if they put out content that educates the high schoolers who follow them, and then those students become motivated <clears throat> to talk to their parents and their parents go talk to the school board, right? That's kind of that, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm losing my voice. That's that secondary influencer uh, process. So one second, let me get a drink of water. Okay, I'm back. Um, uh, this is another chart that I found really helpful. It's called the social barometer. And excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. I'm gonna actually just let you read uh, this chart and I'll ask you if you have any questions or comments about it. So go ahead and just read this. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, I hope I can talk for the rest of this presentation. Um, what you're seeing on this chart that you just looked at is another representation of that spectrum of allies and opposition. Um, so you, if you see inside the pie chart from left to right, it's leading activists, active allies, passive allies, uh, neutrals, passive opponents, active opponents and then leading opponents, right? So it's that spectrum of allies to opposition. And then if you look outside the pie chart, it gives you appropriate goals for each of these groups. So with leading activists, you wanna actively support them. You wanna nurture them. You wanna encourage them. You wanna provide feedback. You wanna identify and contact them. With active allies, you wanna increase your cohesion with them. You wanna empower them. You want to provide them with opportunities to support you. With passive allies, now these are people who agree with you but aren't engaged, you want to encourage their participation, right? With people in the middle who are, aren't aware and they're just neutral and they're not engaged, you just want to build a relationship with them. You want to win them over to your side. You want to inform and educate them. <clears throat> then we get into the, the opponent side of the spectrum. You have passive opponents, people in groups who don't agree with you, but they're not organized. They're not engaged. Well, you don't want to provoke them into action, right? They may not agree with you, but if they're not doing anything, try not to provoke them. Keep them on the sidelines. Uh, then we get into active opponents. People, who, groups disagree with you and they're organized. They're working against you. You want to give them opportunities to change their position. You want to recognize their actual needs and fears, right? No one is just acting randomly. Everyone's motivated by something. You want to, you want to recognize what, what they actually need and what they fear. You might try to arouse doubts, make them question their position. You always want to build a relationship with them. Even, even if they're opposed to you and they're organized against you, if you're going to be showing up at school board meetings, they're probably going to be showing up at school board meetings too. You might as well know them uh, so you have a relationship with them. <clears throat> and with your leading opponents, you want to be soft on the person but hard on the problem. That just means have honest conversations. Be clear about where you disagree. 
be clear about how you have a different vision for society, but don't make it personal, right? You can still be personally collegial and that leaves the door open for the possibility of change. And it, at, the, at your most hardcore opponents who there's just really no possibility of, of changing their position or dissuading them from acting, maybe the best you can do is reveal their motives. Um, let's say that a fossil fuel uh, funded uh, it, you know, industry think tank uh, has uh, is organizing to oppose our fossil fuel free resolution at the school board, and they've created uh, a bogus organization. You know, with some generic sounding name like um, San Diegans for School Security, right? And all they all they really are is uh, an industry funded group who wants to oppose any climate action. Maybe we can reveal their motives. Maybe maybe we can. Uh, Maybe we can reveal to the public where their funding comes from and what their real motivation is. And maybe that will help undermine their opposition to our work. Um, so any questions about this, um, <clears throat> this social barometer, this, this spectrum of allies and oppositions and, and all of these, these goals that are appropriate you know, for these different groups? Um, and, and this is also in your worksheet. Were, were there any questions about that? What I love about this is that it, it helps you break down what appropriate goals there are for each of these groups and, and, it, and it helps focus your efforts. So this is a great resource to, to refer to. I'm going to go back to sharing uh, the slides here. Okay. <clears throat> we are now talking about picking a target picking tactics and setting a timeline. So we refer to our power map. All of this is cumulative, right? This is a step-by-step -step process you can go through to plan your campaign and make it strategic and effective. Based on your power map, who or what are the primary targets for your campaign? Who has the power to say yes to what you want? Maybe it's the school board directly, but maybe your group doesn't have enough influence to, uh, to affect the school board directly. Maybe you wanna target your campaign at, at an influencer group like the PTA or the teachers union, or even a secondary influencer like a social media influencer. You could try to contact them and get and influence the content they're putting out, right? So pick your target, look at your, at your power map and pick your target. Then decide what tactics are appropriate <clears throat> for your target and for the asks that you're gonna make of your target. Again, we can, we can go back a slide and look at our social barometer. Based on where they are on our spectrum of allies and opposition, we could look at uh, these options for setting goals and we could pick one of them. Let's say they're a passive ally and we just want to encourage them to participate, right? That helps us set a goal for what we're gonna do. Um, we wanna think in terms of what types of tactics we wanna use and I, I offer, a. What, what many people think in terms of uh, inside versus outside tactics. Inside tactics basically play by the rules, right? If we're trying to influence the school board, maybe we could send petitions, we could make phone calls, we could send letters or postcards, we could request meetings. It kind of plays by the school board's own rules. We try to interact with them on their terms. Outside tactics are where we don't really play by their rules. We play by our own rules and we try to engage them on our terms, which might not be their terms. So we might, <clears throat> we might throw a rally outside one of their offices, right? To try and generate press. We might have a protest. We might even do a sit-in. We might, NVDA is nonviolent direct action. We might try to get media to, uh, to influence their position by uh, you know, affecting the way that they're viewed by the public, right? Our targets don't usually like it when we use outside tactics and they can be riskier, but it gives us more options, right? If the inside tactics, if they're not responsive, right? Um, often if, if politicians don't wanna hear what we have to say, they can ignore petitions. They can, they can have a meeting with us and then just ignore us. They can throw our letters in the trash, right? But if we do a protest and we get media, suddenly that's putting them under pressure that they might have, feel the need to respond to. Um, Always when we're choosing our tactics, we wanna set what are called SMART goals. That's an acronym for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. 
um, it kind of speaks for itself, but you just want to make sure that your tactics are specific, not vague, that they're measurable. So you can actually assess whether you've succeeded or not, that there's something achievable. So you're not just trying to do something that you don't have the ability to do, but instead have something that you can succeed at and build on. It needs to be relevant to your goals and time bound just means has a deadline. It, it shouldn't go on forever, right? Everyone's lives are busy. We need to be motivated by deadlines. And then you want to ask when picking your tactics, well, what skills or resources does your group have or maybe need for these tactics? Do we need to get more information? Do we need to acquire new skills? Do we need to bring more people into our group? Um, and then for your timeline, you need to ask, well, what's a reasonable timeline for action on this issue? Do your targets operate on schedules that might constrain or inform your campaign? So again, with, with our school board example, the school board meets every month, right? So that gives us a framework to work within. We could say, okay, we want to show up at next month's meeting and give public comments. That gives us a, 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 a schedule and a framework uh, to work around. So real quick, any questions about uh, the target tactics or timeline? Or comments, co contributions? And if not, we can go ahead and move forward. OK, switching gears a little bit, um, every campaign needs to have a narrative. That's the story that your campaign is telling the world. And uh, there are some tried and true methods for having an effective campaign narrative. First, show, don't tell. Don't talk in abstraction, but highlight specific moments. Try to connect with your audience emotionally not rationally. We are all inundated with so many facts and statistics. And now in the world of, of fake news and misinformation, it's very difficult to connect with people on a rational level, um, at, you know, outside of some kind of like specific, maybe academic setting, right? Um, but it's always possible to connect with people emotionally. If you can move your audience, give them something specific and emotional, to connect with, that's gonna be compelling for them. And you wanna use um, elements of what is called a public narrative. And a public narrative is just, it's, it's a story of your campaign for the public. It's, it's how you want the public to understand the story of what you're trying to do. And a public narrative has three parts, a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of a really, really outstanding public narrative in just a minute. But what you'll see in this example is that the story of self has a couple different components. What called you to this work? What, what, to back up, the story of self is why your audience should listen to you. Who are you? Why should they care what you have to say? You wanna let them know what called you to this work? What challenges did you or your, your community face? And what choices did you make? The story of us is where you bring your audience into an us that you're creating, right? It, they're not just listening to you, but now they're a part of a group with you. The story of us includes what do you and your audience have in common? What experiences have you shared? That helps create a, a sense of community and group cohesion. And then you need a story of now. What, and the story of now is just, is, is a story about the current moment that your, that your community faces. What, what are the challenges of the moment? What, what challenge or opportunity do you face? What is your ask? Why is it important? And finally, what is the nightmare and what is the dream? With climate change, we all know the nightmare, right? It's runaway climate change, environmental injustice, um, all the things that we're afraid of, species loss, habitat destruction, uh, migration crises, social destabil destabilization, very scary stuff. But, there's, but we can't just stick with the nightmare. We need to give the dream too. What is the vision of the future that we want of a just, equitable, sustainable, fair society that is that uh, that will be safe for everybody for generations to come? Uh, far too often with activism and campaigning, we get stuck in the nightmare and we forget to talk about the dream. So now I want to share um, an example from the Sunrise Movement. Sunrise is a uh, a climate activist network that um, is led by young people of my generation, millennials, 
and um, and and Gen Z, the the next generation coming after us, high schoolers, undergraduates, people in their early twenties. Uh, Sunrise um, really rose to national prominence when they uh, did a sit-in in Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi's office in fall 2018. It was the day after the um, the 2018 November elections. It was when Alexandria Ocasio Cortez was elected on a platform of championing the Green New Deal um, to decarbonize the United States economy in an equitable way. And Sunrise seized the moment and they planned the sit-in for, uh, for Nancy Pelosi's office to try to get the democratic leadership to commit to championing a Green New Deal. And this is a speech from uh, Jeremy Ornstein, who is a, is a young person who's a member of Sunrise. Um, he was a, uh, a high schooler at the time. He gave the speech. Uh, he went on to college. I think he's graduated now. And we're just going to take about six minutes to watch a video of Jeremy's speech uh, in this sit-in. And I think you'll see that he, he gives a story of self. He gives a story of us. And he gives a story of now. And, it, and it's, it's really very moving and compelling. Um, and just as kind of a warning, he refers to things uh, like the Holocaust and uh, gun violence. And, um, and then he ends up talking about climate change as well. So um, that's what we're going to watch right now. And are you seeing um, are you seeing my YouTube uh, screen with the, with the ad playing right now? Yes, I, we can see the screen. Just I don't hear anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here, here it is. Not hearing anything, Peter, coming from it. Oh, you're not you're not hearing it. Um, I think I can share the sound here. Let, let, let me fix this here. One second, sorry guys. Yes. Okay. Um, let me know if you're hearing it now. I'm gonna start telling a story about my grandparents. They were born in Hungary. And when the Nazis rose to power, they lost almost everyone, friends and family, killed in the Holocaust. But they survived the war and, and moved to Cincinnati, Ohio to start a new life. I remember one day I was maybe eight and my brother was ten and we were in my grandparents' apartment. And I remember my brother Nicholas secretly taking a copy of my grandmother's Holocaust memoirs and going into the bathroom to read it. And I remember my parents finding him and, and bringing him out and, and gently scolding him and saying to both of us, you're too young to read this. You're gonna, you're gonna have to wait a few years. And I remember thinking, my brother shouldn't have broken those rules. And also remember asking myself, when will I be old enough to read those stories? And it was just a few years later when my parents let me follow my brother into the temple auditorium where there was a presentation on the Holocaust. I remember how mature I felt. You know, my head was up, my shoulders were back, and I was full of resolve. Because you have to be full of resolve when you're grappling with something so serious, when you're dealing with the past that's so painful. And I walked in, and almost immediately to my right, I saw a book on a table and read that the Nazis pretended the gas chambers were showers to kill the Jews. And I remember that I was devastated by that fact and all of my resolve fell from my shoulders. And before I left that room, I had to grow up. So many times in the past few years, I have had to grow up. Like the first, second, and third time I read about kids being shot in schools. And the end when we all learned about the lead in the water in Flint. And every time that I read or see about the aftermath of climate fuel disasters, like the fires that are killing people, record fires, I read that. 
And my resolve is so shaken that I have to grow up. On October 27th, I was going to call my dad to ask him a question about my bank account. And he said, Jeremy, did you hear what happened? I said, no, dad, what? He said, did you hear what's going on right now? I said, no, dad, what? He said, there's a shooter in a synagogue in Pittsburgh. And he's, he's shooting people right now. He's shooting people right now. And my dad's voice broke. He's shooting people right now. And I was wearing a hat and I threw the hat to the ground and I, I listened to my dad cry. And I felt really afraid for myself. My grandparents knew that when politicians plant seeds of fear and hate, those seeds turn into bullets and blood. Now I know that too. So I listened to my dad cry and I felt afraid. And then I grew up. Speaker Pelosi, last year I was the chair of the High School Democrats of America. I wonder if you remember this past June, Speaker Pelosi, you came and spoke to us. I wonder if you remember how well dressed we were, how serious and attentive we were, how serious we were about fixing these problems. Because we have endured bullets and storms and fires because we have had to grow up one too many times. Speaker Pelosi, Democratic leadership, we are asking you to grow up. When will you confront? <laughs> Speaker Pelosi, when will you confront the roots of division and hatred? When will you come up with a plan to stop the climate crisis and defend the homes of millions of would-be climate refugees? When will you embrace a Green New Deal? When, Speaker Pelosi? You know, everybody, I, you know, I got a sort of a feeling that she's going to come out of the office and she's going to shake our hands and say, now, now is the day. I have hope in, I have hope in her and I have hope in the Democrats who I've worked so hard to support because my grandparents, they needed hope to survive. You know, please, Speaker Pelosi, come of age with us, care for us and we'll care for each other and we'll join in that great American tradition of rising to meet a challenge. Join us, come on. But if you can't, if you're too scared to try, if you're too corrupt or cowardly, Democrats, if your hands are too deep in the pockets of the fossil fuel executives to try, then get out of the way. Because <laughs> choice but to get to work because we know that we have no choice but to hope because I know I have no choice but to hope so join us as we demand a green new deal thanks everyone let's keep it up Okay, so what did people think about Jeremy's speech there? Wow. Young people, they know how to speak truth and how to make a point. That's all I got to say. He's, he was right on, on target. And that's a great example of the things that you just on that slide. It's a great example of that presentation. And it hits the points of the truth of reality of what's happened in the past how we neglect to look at what's going on and then we have to deal with it in the future or have no future. Thanks, JD. Any other comments on uh, Jeremy's speech? Yeah, I, I just think it was masterful how, I mean, he had so much passion, you know, um, it was his body, you could tell it was filled with it, but I think it was masterful how he kind of wove together, you know, this thread talking about his grandparents and, and you know, what happened with Nazi Germany. And, you know, it wasn't a pointing a finger that it was, again, the story of, of me, the story of us. And then he went to the story of now. 
it was very powerful. I mean, it's extremely powerful for me. Yes, Tanisha, go ahead. Yeah, just following that, you know, I, I've, I've seen it before and every time I see it, it doesn't change. I mean, I, I can feel the lump in my throat, just the connection that he makes, the passion that is obvious there, but the vulnerability that he allows to come through, not just from the story itself, but for his own personal being. And, um, and, I, and I just, I love it so much. And, and, I, and personally for myself, a lot of times I speak very passionately. And when it comes down to it and being a black woman, I'm Afro-Latina, but black is definitely what resonates when people see me, is that I have to sometimes make, make it be known and literally state, I am not talking to you through aggression. I'm talking with passion. Please do not take what I say as or in the form that I'm speaking it, especially speaking in the same way where he's not necessarily yelling, right? But he's speaking so passionately. And unfortunately, sometimes depending on the cultures that are speaking, sometimes it can be taken differently. And sometimes the context that's supposed to be there is dismissed because of the tone that people hear. And everything that he did, I feel like is 100% is right. I, I wouldn't change anything that he did. Um, and I would just like to encourage those, especially on this call, that if you hear, uh, especially a minority, and particularly a, a black woman speaking, please do not take it as we are speaking aggressively, but just passionately, because it, it has to be passionate to get the point across. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I just want to amplify Tanisha's message as well. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Um, any other thoughts on, um, on Jeremy's speech? And specifically, how did we see him use the, the story of self, the, 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 the story of us, the story of now? In my view, it was very, um, uh, it was very clean as far as how he did it and how he blended. He went from the story of of me to the story of us to the story of now. I mean, it was very, it was very smooth transition. You, I mean, you hardly knew that he was doing that. And then one of the things that I always say when I'm talking to folks about this concept, when we're when you're presenting speeches and you have passion, that nobody ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart. And if you remember that, I think it's important that, you know, that when we speak with passion is when we help to motivate people, um, that the pie charts and the graphs and that kind of stuff, and that, like you were saying, the facts and figures and all that, you know, it's not going to get people off the couch. Thanks, Kathy. And then I think to Tanisha's point, um, there can be a racial dimension in how that passion is perceived sometimes um, as well, which is really important to keep in mind. Um, Friends, we are almost out of time. We just have five minutes left. I won't have time to make it through everything else that I uh, prepared for us, but um, I'll encourage you to, uh, to view the slides when I send a follow-up email and take a deeper dive into the, some of the resources. But I'll just quickly go through um, some of the remaining ideas I have and we'll skip some of the examples and then I'll see if anyone has any final thoughts here. Um, so just to return to the slides. The final step of uh, campaigning is you've done your action, you've gotten the result you've gotten. It's not always a success, right? In fact, with grassroots work, with progressive or, or leftist work, um, often we do not succeed. Most of the time we do not succeed. It's very rare when we just succeed. Um, often we just simply lose, we just get a no. But many times it's somewhere in the middle where it's a little complicated, it's not what we expected and it's hard to tell. Um, so you always wanna make sure to schedule time with your campaign team um, to debrief, assess, and evaluate. You wanna ask, did the campaign achieve its goals? What lessons were learned from the campaign? What organizational capacities were developed or are still needed? What relationships were developed? How did your perspective evolve over the course of the campaign? And then you always wanna think in terms of continuation uh, escalation and pivoting. Uh, campaigns to be successful must be sustained long-term efforts. That's why there, there was so much emphasis earlier in the presentation of building sustained relationships with coalition partners and not just doing a one-off task together or one-off action. You wanna continue the campaign because you're not gonna win the first time. Um, Rebecca Solnit, the writer I mentioned in Hope in the Dark, she says, it's always too soon to go home. And I just love that because no matter what outcome you got, Rebecca Solnit says, you know, you've got to keep fighting. If you're going home, it's too soon. There's always tomorrow. There's always more to do. 
So you want to ask, how will you measure success or failure or maybe partial success? Are there opportunities to, to st strategically escalate your tactics? How can you leverage failure into the next phase of your campaign? Even if you fail, how can you use that outcome to, to pivot into the next phase? And then I really encourage you when I send out the slides to take a look at some of these case studies and principles from the Beautiful Trouble book. Um, I, I pulled out some of my favorites, but the, the book is filled with all different kinds of inspirational educational examples that I really encourage you to check out. But unfortunately we won't have time uh, to look at here together today. Um, so that's it everybody. That's our training on how to advocate and campaign. Uh, thank you so much for being with us with San Diego 350. Um, oh, actually I did have one more slide to share with you, uh, which is, you, you can feel free to contact me anytime, peter at sandiego350.org. Um, and like I said, the school board electrification campaign is not hypothetical. It's happening right now. And next Tuesday, April 25th, uh, we will be showing up at the school board um, to give public comment to demand that they pass this resolution to electrify everything by 2030 and go fossil fuel free. So you can go to sandiego350.org slash events and you can find our page for the electrify everything at SDUSD um, action. You'll find a toolkit with talking points and all the resources you need to, um, to participate in this action. And uh, we really hope to see you next Tuesday. Um, also check out other events at sandiego350.org slash events. We always have campaign events, outreach events, educational events, trainings like this, um, opportunities for, for new volunteers to get involved. So please see what we're up to. Um, and then beyond that, just thank you for joining us tonight. And um, if you have any final questions or comments, please feel free to hang out on the Zoom. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now and, and thank you all for being here. You did a great it's job, a copy Peter. Of the Thank you, Peter, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well,